Hello, welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Tamara. Hello, this is uh, the infant feeding team again. I'm Hannah, um, infant feeding lead, and Alex, my job chair. Hello, Alex. We're here to chat to you about all things infant feeding again. Um, and to wish you a very happy breastfeeding celebration week, which is this week. Um, it's a week uh, nationally that we um, try to raise awareness around breastfeeding um, and talk about it in the wider society. So it's everybody's role to help normalise and support breastfeeding. So um, partners, granddads, um, your neighbours, everything. We've all got a role in normalising supporting breastfeeding families. It's also a great opportunity to celebrate all the amazing hard work that breastfeeding families do to reach their, their breastfeeding goals or get as close to their breastfeeding goals as they can. So it's a, it's a time to celebrate um, all that hard work and nurturing and love that goes in, into supporting a small person and feeding them and, um, and really thinking um, about how we can support you and how you can get support from the community around you to continue doing that um, for as long as you both wish. Um, I can see we've already got 24 people watching, oh, so thank wonderful. you very much, nice to Hello. see you. And uh, we've got a few things to talk about today, um, just in case you don't give us lots of questions, but do all, by all means start any questions. It'd be nice to see a thumbs up so you can hear us, because I, I haven't seen any yet. Um, it'd be good to see to know that they're coming through, and we'll see you see them coming up. Um, I hope to see if any, any of our regulars are there. We've met a few of you since, we've, there's a thumbs up, thank you. Um, we've met a few of you since we've been doing these. It's been really lovely to um, see people's names on the questions and then meet them on the wards or yeah. having conversations with them on the telephone. And it's a lovely continuity and we hope we are finding it useful too. So that's been good for loads of thumbs up coming. Thank you very much, one and all, that's lovely. But, um, so yeah, we were gonna chat about why you know, why we have Breastfeeding Celebration Week, weren't we, Hannah? Yeah, and um, one of the really nice things, which is not a new thing, but was produced a little while ago, I think by um, the National Childbirth Trust, wasn't it, Alex? Yes. Um, is um, Reasons to be Proud. And so it really took, um, it, it, it wrote um, down what the different um, advantages might be of having breastfed your baby for a certain amount of time. So they're rather than looking at the big picture, because sometimes 24 hours um, in a day is a really long time in breastfeeding terms. If you're struggling, or just if you're up a lot with a baby and, and you're getting not a lot of sleep, and you're, when you're experiencing every single one of those 24 hours, it, it feels a long time. So it's just um, a list of um, facts about the various um, advantages that um, is afforded by breastfeeding to you and your baby. So Alex has got it there. Yeah, you? just before we go on to it though, because I know what happens, we struggle with catching these messages back up again. Leah, who's one of our top fans, um, has said she saw Hannah today and she's, things are going much better Ooh, now. So yes. well done, Leah. Yeah. Thank you both nice. for like well. Leah. And Abby has come back, she can hear us and see us, which is great. Thank you, Abby. And Sarah has said she had her baby. Sarah Theobald, this is, because she's been one of our Ooh, regulars. And she had a baby on Sunday on the spas. Wow. Um, he was going on every hour and then half hour. He wasn't settling. Um, where we are. So she's given him some formula because um, he hadn't weed um, to help with that. Um, and she's now expressing, well done Sarah, that's fantastic. Um, just keep going, perhaps you can give us a shout and we can talk you through how to increase your milk supply. Um, perhaps you can give us a call so we've got your telephone number and we can have a talk through how to increase your milk supply. Because mm -hmm. if you've only been on, on Sunday, you've got plenty of time to push yeah, your milk early supply up. Well done. And we've got a lovely thumbs up from Louise. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, so moving on, to talk about this reasons to be proud. As Hannah said, it was an NCT thing. And it, I remember when it originally came out, many, many years ago, when I was originally a breastfeeding counsellor with the NCT. And I loved it because it, it is literally called Reasons to be Trapped Proud. And I'm not expecting you to be able to read it, but it is so lovely because it talks about each stage. So it talks about the fact that that first feed helps to stabilise the baby's blood sugars and protect the baby's gut. Because we know that that, that colostrum lines the baby's gut and protects the baby from other things going through the gut. Um, mucosa and that is a great opportunity for skin to skin for the mummy and then it literally goes down day by day so it talks about the antibodies in your colostrum on the first day and that's that natural protection that mums provide and every single um, bug that a mother has ever had 
she's producing antibodies in, and it, they, she's produced antibodies and they come into her milk and she gives those to her baby in her colostrum. And that is a fantastic beginning, you know, like a first vaccine. So from a mummy's point of view, it helps contract her uterus. So over time, a woman who is breastfeeding will bleed less because actually her uterus is contracting really well and she'll then have um, less bleeding in the long term. It goes on, I would highly recommend that you go and have a look at it. So maybe what we'll do is have a look and see. Um, we can try and paste it, can't we, after our session. Yeah, so Bethan's asking where are we based and what are our roles? We're based at the John Radcliffe Hospital in the Women's Centre in Maternity and we're the, the joint infant feeding leads, we're a job share. Um, so this is Hannah Torrance and I'm Alex Mulford. And we're both midwives and we're both lactation consultants. So we run other members of our team. And normally, yeah. outside of COVID times, we also run services in the north um, at the Horton and um, the Cotswold um, Maternity Centre as well. So um, you, you can also see members of our team um, in the north of the county as well. And we hope to be extending that um, south in in the near future as well. Once we're allowed to have face, more face-to-face -face yeah. contact again. We also do lots of telephone support for people. We spend a lot of time on our telephones, on the telephone support people. We're also doing video support. Mm -hmm. I've been on the video, on the video um, sort of clinic appointments this morning and how has been on the phone. We and support GPs <laughs> and other health professionals don't yeah. we, with um, more complex questions around feeding um, and we have a really good relationship with a lot of the wonderful voluntary organisations like Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support and La Leche who are very, very active in Oxfordshire um, and so we have really good um, professional working links with them as well So um, it's, and with the health visiting team as well. I'll give a shout out to the Abingdon Baby Cafe yeah, as well. She's been going for 18 yeah. years now. Wonderful. So, um, she's fantastic and yeah. a fantastic support to the women in the area. And OBS, Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support, and Abingdon Baby Cafe are all doing offering video conf in, you know, video um, appointments as well. So they've actually they got off the block before we did. We, and we the Let's Day are still running their meetings, their mother to mother support meetings, and you can also call a local leader if you go on their Leche website. Yeah. Right. So we have, um, so Chris has come through, thank you Chris, thank you for these videos, we're due to be with you any day now, yeah. planning as much as possible for a smooth and calm journey into the JR. I have two questions, uh, does the JR car park take contact, contactless car mm -hmm. payment? Well, that's a really good question because certainly mm -hmm. at, um, at the lower level, which is outside um, in the lower car park, lower, um, car park one, um, there are two machines there do not. I've noticed that. It does say, please bring correct change. I can't speak for the one when you come in from level two, which is the main maternity entrance, and that's something um, we could perhaps try and find out and let you know. If, you, if it's during working hours, um, if you go into the main hospital corridor and go to the parking and security services, it's signed on the left-hand side of the corridor, you can pay using your phone. And, oh, there you go. And, contact, and contactless. I didn't and know that. The right money. Yeah. You just need to take your ticket with you. So it's just between working hours and when they're in. Yeah. And which door do we enter the Women's Centre through? There seems to be two, thank you. Um, you come through the one on uh, with this signposted maternity entrance. There's one that's outpatients, and that one you access through the car park, car park one. The one that's slightly higher up is the maternity entrance, and that's the one you would come in. Then there's a couple of buttons, and you press the one that's relevant to you, which will probably be the maternity assessment unit mm -hmm. delivery suite button. Tell mm -hmm. them where you're going, and you'll be coming in there. So, so yeah. it's level two entrance, and it's under the white awning where you sometimes see ambulances and things. That entrance of the women's centre is where you'd come to and press the button. Hope that answers your questions, Chris, and we look forward to meeting you. Yeah, some it's point. exciting yeah. times. Yeah. So thinking more about what else this is, to read, the further reasons to be proud. Um, things like food and drink, and I think most people know this, food and drink, um, you know, breast milk, is always already at the right temperature and adapts to a baby's needs. And it also helps mums as well, because there's a, there's a huge hormonal impact on it all, obviously. Uh, but it also helps mums go back to sleep. And I have to say, from a personal point of view, my husband thought that was the perfect excuse never to have to help me at night times. So not giving anybody any ideas, but he said, well, he knew I had the right hormones, so he didn't need to help me at night, because mm. I would go back to sleep. Talk about the, the impact of premature babies as well, mm. couldn't we? The changing milk. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that, Hannah. Yeah, so um, when mothers have their baby early, um, we know that 
the milk is slightly different in composition to milk um, that a mother would be producing if she had a term baby. Some people think this is possibly because if the baby's very early that the mammary gland, the breast, hasn't fully reached um, the level of development that it needs to be at. But um, there's another school of thought that thinks actually this is the mother's body actually knowing that this baby is premature and it's a kind of evolutionary safety mechanism because a lot of premature uh, baby's milk is, is it has a lot of the anti-infective um, factors um, and, it, and, it's, um, and it continues to have a high level of antibodies um, and, and so it does seem to afford these little babies of the extra protection um, that they so desperately need in those first few weeks before they turn. It's really fascinating. We know that the mother's body has an internal clock, so just like all of us um, proceed from infancy to, through childhood and then at puberty through adolescence to adulthood, um, when the placenta, the afterbirth, comes away after birth, um, the mother's, it starts a ticking clock in the mother's body. And so her breast milk, once she reaches a full supply for her baby in the first few weeks, the average um, amount is about 750 mils, we think. Um, the breast milk, the volume of breast milk never ever increases. That baby, no matter how um, old that baby is before weaning, it, it never gets more. What it does is it's very clever because that internal clock changes the um, composition of the breast milk and it's absolutely fascinating. So it, when the baby is um, a certain age, the breast milk, the mother's body starts to produce certain factors more, more uh, abundantly in her milk to support the baby. For example, when the baby starts to crawl and is at a developmental stage where it's putting things in its mouth for the first time and experiencing the world through its mouth, um, there's a that there's a component called lysozyme and that breaks down the, wall, the cell walls of bacteria um, to kill them off and that becomes quite abundant in, in mother's milk um, when the baby is at that age. So it's really fascinating. It can also adapt to the weather or the wellness of the baby. So we know that these um, constituents in breast milk change. They change even from the morning to the evening. Um, so it's a really um, bioactive living fluid, just like blood, um, it's constantly adapting and changing um, for the, to, to the baby's needs, so it's fascinating really. We've had a few thank yous, we're just going to move on to that, so Kirsty said um, she's uh, pleased that we're doing them and thank you for continuing to do them. Um, Chris has thanked us as well and uh, Pat have found them very reassuring and I'd like to say a big hello to Paula in China, Paula McCann's one of our former colleagues who used to work oh, by, yeah. hello Paula. Hi, Paula, lovely to hear from you. Okay. So, that, that, no questions at the moment, so what else do we have on our list we were talking about today? Okay. So, going back to what Alex was saying about antibodies, there's a certain type of antibody, which I think is a really good fun fact, um, that um, we mostly produce in our, our wet um, tissue areas, like our gums and our eyes, and it's a really important um, antibody, and it's the first defence against bacteria that might, we might encounter in our environment, such as a hospital or out in the community. And newborn babies cannot produce this antibody. It's completely absent for about the first three weeks of life. And the baby is completely dependent on the mother's milk um, for this antibody. And it's produced in the, in the mother's milk and the baby's given a daily dose of this um, antibody. And so, you can see how it's really important that breast milk is not a replaceable fluid um, and that it, 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 you are effectively um, your baby's immune system in those uh, early weeks and months. So it's amazing that wonderful symbiosis between baby and mother. So that's another celebration week fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be sick of them. Well, maybe we should stop. <laughs> Siobhan's message to say she's met quite a few of us now, and uh, we've been on the phone to her, and she's been one of our regulars on these things. And that, it's, that's exactly well, who I was thinking of as one of the people that we've met through doing this. So, yeah, recognise her name, and then met her, and it's been lovely. But I think that takes out some of that 
fear factor of people meeting new people because I know that this, these Facebook lives have been great because you've been able to do tours of the hospital. Wendy's gone round and introduced people to lots of you know people gone round in the delivery suite, talked about induction of labour and um, C sessions, and it's been a fabulous way for you to meet us all in a time when it's so difficult to do face to face. But also, so if you're coming and parking, which is a really good plus side. And the Women's Centre, we're really lucky um, here at the John Redcliffe in Oxford because the Women's Centre is a separate little building um, from the rest of the hospital on its own on the top of the hill and we're actually a fairly small community here so there's not that many different staff groups and we, we have a smaller um, patient population as well so um, and with every, all the things that have been happening with COVID it's been a, it's been a real advantage to have the Women's Centre as a um, as almost a kind of separate kingdom so we've been really really effective at kind of closing our borders and being very very careful so just reassuring any families who are about to have a baby thinking of Chris and you know, d uh, might be feeling slightly anxious about coming into the hospital, um, just to let you know that that has been a real plus for us, and we have been able to sort of keep the Women's Centre a relatively safe place. So um, I think that's been a real, real, um, a real boon. So carrying on with some of the other things on the reasons to be proud, I've picked up on the one that's at three months. So as I said, it goes down, it starts at one day and goes down to two years. And at three months, it talks that about babies being five times less likely to get diarrhoea and a reduced risk for the whole of the year of, that, of their life. This is being breastfed. And actually, if you think about that, that means fewer trips to the GP. And mothers who are working, that's fewer days off work. So, you know, the, the, this ongoing protection that the baby gets from being breastfed is phenomenal. Um, so, you know, we know that it has a really protective um, property in that respect, and babies are much, much less likely to end up with uh, gastrointestinal problems. So that's a really good one there. Um, so she wants to come back with another question. What would be the reason why a latch is good, but during, during the fever it starts to be pinchy? I haven't moved or moved the baby. Is it to do with the suckle towards the end? Um, it could be, Siobhan, but it could also be if your arms are getting a little bit tired. Make sure you're well supported. So we know that when you're holding a baby, we wrap it on the breast. If, I, if you're the Siobhan, I remember, you've got a very big chap. <laughs> and oh, he's he? probably quite awake. Oh, I think he is, yes. He's yeah. quite, yes, quite he's awake. We saw him the other day. <laughs> So if you're thinking about holding a baby at the breast, that's very, very tiring. So using your other hand to support that, to mm. support your hand, and even then filling that gap. Mm. And I know in the past we've always used pillows, but actually I have to say, I think something like a cellular blanket that's got a bit of rigidity to it is much better. Mm. So you could then fill that gap, roll up a, a cellular blanket and put it between your wrist and your knee. Mm. And that way you're, you're, your arm isn't taking it on. Because mm. I think a lot of it is babies they're getting a bit heavy and mums are slowly mm. but surely letting them go a little bit lower and that can make a big and difference. Another natural way of helping that would be to ask mum to defer to, to <laughs> the mat. So, so if yes. Alex was to change the gravity yes. and, and maybe keep the baby upright then she's not got so much weight through her wrist there as well so that might yeah. be something to try just to sort of change the because when you're sitting very upright, you're having to keep that, yeah. your baby on you. But when if you take a little bit more of a laid back position, you might find that you can sort of spread the weight of your baby a little bit more so it's not going through your wrist. So going back to sort of pinching, yes, possibly, possibly. Yeah. Um, I mean, an upright position where you have the baby straddling your leg and bringing them on like that, and then you can lean back is also <laughs> good. Any sort of, as our colleague Naomi would put it, face planting position <laughs> will, will actually help in that respect. But I think a lot of it, I'm afraid, is to do with that actually that hold is getting slightly less firm and the baby's then actually having to hang on and that becomes pinchy. So it might be that, Siobhan. Mm. Try and make sure you're well supported. And also remember it will get slightly better in the sense of your baby gets a little bit more um, of an active participant in breastfeeding. So as they get older, they developmentally become a bit more, they have a bit more agency at the breast, so he'll sort of hold on a bit more. Um, and also the hormones of pregnancy actually relax all of, the, all of your joints and so you'll have quite a lot of that and when you're breastfeeding it does keep that level a little bit higher of what we call relaxing and so you may find that you've got a little, that sort of weakness you're feeling in your in your wrists and hands can be because of the hormones as well and a lot of Side -lying. Side -lying. Yeah, mm -hmm. and a lot of others struggle with um, carpal tunnel as well mm -hmm. don't they they find it very difficult to keep that pressure mm -hmm. on when they're, when they're struggling with that yeah i wanted about maybe some sideline positions yes, yeah, side yeah. yeah, because 
then you're not sort of having to, to you know, the, the, the bed is taking the weight of your baby as well. That might be worth trying. Um, they tend to kick their um, legs against your leg and push themselves a bit too high, so it's just about making sure you're bringing him back down nose to nipple if you're going to try the side lying. Right, we, Francesca has said her baby's three weeks old. Oh, sorry, let me quickly go back. Beth and said, do we work across all the wards in the women's centre? We work throughout the hospital, um, so we can uh, we can end up in any part of the women's centre. We go where, where we need it. So our staff are really, really well trained. Every member of staff here has gone undergone infant feeding training, and they can deal with all your standard positioning and attachment help, teaching you how to hand express. We tend to get involved where things are getting a little bit more tricky, where they, people need a little bit more support. So. If things are going really well for you and it's all going swimmingly, then you won't see us. If, um, if there's a little bit more help needed, then we might be asked to be involved. Mm -hmm. We are available throughout the hospital. And we carry a bleep um, and we're also available by, by phone. And so all the staff in the Women's Centre know that. And if they've got um, some uh, family that they think might um, benefit from a bit of extra support or they want to run something past us, they would either bleep or call us and the same with the community with wives, they would call in and discuss family. The bleep went off last week when we were doing <laughs> this actually, yeah. that was a community made wife. Um, Francesca has said that um, her baby's three weeks tomorrow, she feeds really well but the last couple of days, usually late evening after her feed, she just she's just very unsettled and cries. That's really normal, isn't it? I don't know if you've had a chance um, in, in any spare moment you have just to Google cluster feeding. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, well-documented um, behaviour of babies of that yeah. age, um, and it's really hard going, um, especially if you've got other children or you're really tired. Yeah, that's, and that's what Francesca yeah, said, you know, yeah. it's, it happens just as she's really tired and wants you're to You're trying go to, to get bed. tea ready, yeah. the other kids are losing it, yeah. you know, you're tired because you've been running around all day. So it is always that sort of witching hour of sort of five, six o'clock through to kind of bedtime and they go on and off and on and off and they basically want to, they basically want left, to sit down in one place right, and eat them. Left, right, left, <laughs> right. And, and the only thing I would say is, um, I don't know if it helps, one, it's very normal, yeah. uh, uh, two, they do grow out of it, three, the emptier the breast, the fattier the milk. So yeah. when you feel like you're absolutely two little shriveled balloons because your baby's been on and on and on and on and you feel like there's nothing left, actually what your baby is getting really thick, like double cream, like panna cotta out of your breast. So yeah. the emptier your breast, the fattier the milk. So just be reassured that all that feeding, even when you feel like, God, there can't be anything there, um, is actually really beneficial for your baby because it's that really, really creamy, high calorie milk that your baby's getting. Chocolate pudding with yeah. a teaspoon at that stage. So, yeah. uh, I hope that answers your question, Francesca. Do you Google it and do do go to, you know, go to other mother to mother support groups like La Leche and OBS, go have a have a Google online and, and, and have a look at some of the La Leche resources around um, you know, um, be early behaviour in the early weeks and, and cluster feeding. Have a look for those search terms and you'll probably find quite a lot of reassuring um, articles about I it. Certainly when I was training with entity, entity breastfeeding cancer, the, the thought at the time was that babies were learning to try and stock up so that they could learn to go longer at night. But we could never say when that was going to happen. So it, cluster feeding is really, really common. Many mothers find it's it. It's tough, but it, it, you will get, you can get mm. through it. Sometimes so. um, it helps, um, like I was saying, maybe to go to somewhere like the lecture just to hear what other mothers are experiencing. Because mm. sometimes knowing that it's not just your baby and it's not because you're doing something wrong, it's because your baby's being a normal baby, doing yeah. the right things to make sure it gets the right amount of milk from you. But also getting some top tips from other mums and other families who are going through a similar thing. So I know that a lot of mums, and certainly I've done this with some of my kids, is top loading your day. I know that sounds funny, but if you know it's go your, your baby's not going to let you get up from the sofa from the hours of 5 until 10pm, then trying to, when your baby's a bit happier, maybe to be on your in a sling or uh, on the floor or wherever, to, to make dinner. Make dinner first thing in the morning and, and put it into the fridge. And then you'll be so relieved when you get to six o'clock and you can just shove the dinner in the oven and go and sit on the sofa. So some little mm. practical tips that you might pick up from other families might really help just to like, um, sometimes when you move to a point of acceptance and accept that that's what your baby needs from you at that moment and working 
out practical ways of working around that rather than trying to change that behaviour, which will be really difficult to change. If that makes sense. Hopefully that's powerful. I think so many people go through it that it will be useful mm -hmm. for many more, not just Francesca. You're doing great. <laughs> in there. Claire, um, she said she lives in Marlow. She's having her baby here. Um, will she be able to get support from us? Um, she called us wonderful ladies. Mm -hmm. And uh, do I need to find out about feeding support in bugs? My first baby had a tongue tie and I had an emergency section so it was hard to get going um, with the breastfeeding. We did it in the end because I pumped for nine days for well done to keep my supply and eventually um, with the help of the lead, local feeding team in Camden, London, he latched properly. If I have similar trouble this time, who could help me? Thank you. Well, if you've had your baby here, I mean, we've brought you come under our jurisdiction, so absolutely, we'd be there to support you. Um, you know, just keep in touch with us. I really use those voluntary agencies out there that are running things like Zoom and, and appointments that way as well, because uh, we also are doing Attend Anywhere video calls, but if it's specifically things around latch that you, you anticipate you might have trouble with again, um, then thinking about accessing those things online at the moment with, it, with everybody not being able to see as many outpatients as they'd like, that, that might be a good thing to consider now. But I would say every baby is different and every pregnancy is different. As Alex always says, it's like having um, a new dance partner. So you may be surprised, it, it may either be all swimmingly wonderful and you don't have those attachment problems or it could be something else. So you just don't know. Um, but uh, it's good that you have that experience and you know that you can overcome those challenges with the right support. Brilliant. Uh, Kirsty said, I'm 33 weeks with my third. My first two were very quick labours. Four and a half for baby one and 45 minutes for number mm -hmm. two. Wow. Um, from water breaking to baby's That's born. That's an efficient uterus. <laughs> yeah, that is. I worried, um, will MAU want to check how it progressed? Um, where are we? I've got to get this my labour is before my husband can come in. Mm. I was also hoping to deliver and aspire and to mm. I may not make it up there if I have to be checked in MAU first. It, it is always standard practice to come through MAU, you mm -hmm. will go through MAU. But make sure oh, they know. Yeah, Do just, tell them, my last labour was 40 minutes and these are yeah. my concerns. And they'll take you seriously. Mm. You can say the first four and a half, the last at 45. Um, so you know, make sure they're really aware of the situation, mm -hmm. um, and you know, explain you know that mm -hmm. it's been so quick last time. Quick um, labours are a thing, and no midwife in their right mind will uh, not take you seriously. Especially, so. <laughs> when yeah, yeah, especially when you've got four men in it, so subsequent babies. So yeah, so um, I wouldn't hang around at home if you don't want to home birth. Come on in. Come on in. Um, Siobhan, uh, she's going to try and lean back. To can try and eat back. She's already using the muslin blanket instead of the blanket or muslin on her lap anyway. Or a very hard horseshoe pillow. So the sort of yeah. breastfeeding, sometimes they're called boppies or widgies. I'm not really sure why they give them those names. But the slightly harder, firmer horseshoe pillow is good. But I think Alex will probably agree with me that sometimes, especially women with um, l larger or heavier lactating breasts, sometimes the pillow can be a problem so actually get your baby attached really well and have the pillow yeah. close by and pull it in so rather than placing your baby on the pillow to attach them because we find sometimes that results with the baby just being a bit too high and it can mm. either be painful or not a very good attachment so i would say get the attachment right and have the pillow close by to pull in would you agree yeah, yes I yeah. definitely francesca's come back with a thank you and uh, that's exactly how i've been feeling we'll look into it brilliant well done and we've got a thank you from Kirsty as well. So, uh, yeah, good luck, Kirsty. We might yeah, be we'll be waiting to <laughs> find out. Yeah. yeah. As far as it's open and working, I mean, yeah. the baby's being born up there yeah. quite, you know, there's no concerns. The only issue is obviously fifth ball, but and you can still have, and I always used to say this to my sort of delivery suite midwife, you can still have a lovely, lovely normal yes. birth. On and there's some nice, suite. really nice rooms down there. And a, swim, and a pool. So, oh, you know, cool. if you were hoping for a pool birth just because the sparse is full does not mean you may not be able to have a pool birth. They mm. have a pool down there. Room 11 is a pool. It's a lovely, lovely room, and I've, had, I've been lucky enough to be in there for many a birth. It's a really nice place. So, you know, just because you, you, you know, if there's any issue with sparse being um, full, there's no reason why you may yeah, not be able to Yeah, don't feel just because you're going to delivery suite, you can't, um, you know, 
reiterate what your what your wishes yeah. are in labour. And then you know, be, make sure you say I, I want to be really active and mm. you know all of those things because they'll then, be receptive to it. Absolutely, the midwives are totally up for it. They much rather mums are up and active, so uh, if they can be, and they've all got um, they've all got this um, telemetry now, so you know babies being monitored. Mums can be up and moving about. Slightly more difficult, I understand, if mm. um, you know if they're, if they're struggling to track the baby, maybe with t twins on occasion. Um, but generally, the telemetry works really well. So there's no reason why you can't have active labours. And if you want a full birth, there is a pool down there. Mm. So, Stacey's come on. Hello, I was wondering if I, um, if I wanted to go up to the spas, do I call the regular number for MAU when my labour starts, or is there another number to call? Also, do your second uh, se second labours tend to be faster? Um, than your first. P.S. Thank you all for your amazing work. I had my son in the JR in 2016 and was looked after so well. Oh, that's oh, nice to hear. Nice to hear. Um, I, you find the same line as far as I'm aware. Um, MAU tends to triage everything. Um, so do by all means phone there first. If that's anything different, then they will let you know. Just make um, sure you tell them on the phone that I really want to go to the spires if they've got space. Um, so am I, right, am I ringing the right people? But that generally, as Alex says, everything goes through. And they do. So, um, and you asked whether labours, second labours, tend to be faster. They do tend to be. The body seems to know what it's done. It's if it's got, it's usually got a reasonably good memory. The uterus is a muscle, so it has muscle memory. Um, and in certain people's cases, <laughs> not naming anyone, that muscle can be very, very effective mm -hmm. and uh, remember exactly what it's doing. So, yeah, yeah. So sometimes women experience their second and subsequent labours as stronger or. Um, more intense earlier on, um, but that's usually because the muscle is um, ready to go and has done it before. Yes, yeah. and, and you know, I think as a midwife we learn never, never to turn your back on a, on a lady's on a second or third pregnancy or fourth pregnancy even, because they can go from practically not dilated to fully dilated in a matter of minutes mm -hmm. on occasion. So, so we do, you know, we are aware that it can go very, very quickly on yeah. occasion. So. Right, well, we haven't got any more questions at the moment. So do we want to talk a bit more about, a bit more about You'll facts? You'll have to listen to us wittering on. Let's so <laughs> <laughs> come up with something if you want to oh. keep us quiet. <laughs> I seem to have gone off it. Hang on, I've lost my MVP. So, because that's where my questions are coming through. Brilliant. Yeah, you'll be stuck with the lactation geeks. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> um, what else have we got on here? Ear infections. So we know that ear infections are much less likely in babies that are being breastfed. Now that's not just down to um, the, the components of breast milk, that's down to the action. So when a baby breastfeeds, there's a really big jaw action, and we're watching for that when babies are feeding, because that tells us the baby's sucking and swallowing and, and getting a good amount. Um, so when they're doing that, that's helping keeping their eustachian tubes clear. So that leads to, um, you know, sort of much better health in the ears. It also, the thought mm. is to do with whether a baby that is being bottle fed, which is historically babies have always been bottle fed quite flat, is the milk then pooling backwards. Mm. So we now tend to feed babies even with a bottle much more upright. Um, so we have, uh, we've shown this before on these sessions. And that way they have a little bit more control as um, well, yeah. don't they? Yeah, they do. So you find that um, babies that are being bre breastfed and receiving breast milk are less likely to get um, ear infections. But it also has a bigger impact too. So if you want to save orthodontic bills in the future, um, babies that are breastfed have better mm. teeth and mouth formation because the breast is a bigger mm. thing in the mouth. Because babies actually who bottle feed have to learn to purse like this. Um, and that's quite a, um, an unnatural thing for human babies to do. So they're born expecting to open very, very wide and tilt their head back, which is what they need to do at the breast. So it, even babies who are very little who are starting to bottle feed in those early days, they dribble quite a lot from the bottle and they can find it a bit difficult until they learn how to purse. And one of the, the downsides of pursing in that way is it crowds the teeth more and makes the, 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 the teeth, because your baby already has all its little soft teeth in its gums and it can crowd and make the, the channel more narrow. So when baby breastfeeds and baby opens wide, the teeth are able to drop into a um, much better position mm. when they have their mouth open wide. And when they open wide, they close off, naturally close off the eustachian tube, as Alex was saying, so that they don't get the sort of flashback of milk into their ears in the same way that they do if they're um, more chin to chest and pursing. So. 
Yes, so you can save yourself all the, all the dog tip bills in the future. So often you see, yeah. if you go to countries where they where breastfeeding is very much the norm, mm. um, you will see that the children have the most beautiful smiles mm. and the very nice. The vibrant. only caveat to that Different. is if, if if you have a beautiful uh, breastfed toddler's teeth and they smack their teeth off a playground piece of playground equipment, oh. as my little <laughs> child did, then you're stuffed. So the accidental tooth injury can still land you with orthodontics yeah. later on. <laughs> Accepting this, she's not foolproof. <laughs> um, we've got a thank you from Stacey for all of that, and um, Amy. Um, I've recently had a blood test for anemia, which came back normal due to a lot of fatigue and breathlessness. Still having both a lot, just wondering what else can be the causes. Mm. Well, that's rubbish, Amy. Poor you. Yeah, you haven't it. said what, what um, trimester you're in. Um, have you had your little one? Are you still pregnant? I'm wondering about your diet. I'm wondering whether you follow a specific diet. Sometimes if you're um, vegan, um, it can be more difficult to get um, a vitamin called B12, which is really, really important with pregnancy and breastfeeding, but it's very easily supplemented. Um, into your diet, and um, what else? Ooh. Oh, she, oh no, that's not, I thought that was her coming back, it isn't. Oh, she's 23 weeks. Thank oh, you, Amy. 23. She's 23 mm. weeks. Um, I mean, obviously, for, for many people, being pregnant is quite draining. They do feel extremely tired. I don't want to sort of downplay what you're going through, though. Um, obviously, you've had blood tests. I think it's probably worth having a chat with your GP and your midwife. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't plugged it today, but the Ask the Midwife um, line is still open, so they may be able to um, give you some other ideas as well. So that's the Ask the Midwife. Mm -hmm. You look on the MVP, o -O MVP web page, it's got the telephone number. You can give them a call and see mm -hmm. if they've got any, any thoughts. I think that your practitioner so far has done exactly the right thing, yeah, think, Alex, because our first um, sort of suspicion would be whether it was a low haemoglobin and then to supplement you with iron. Um, especially at sort of 23 weeks, that tends to be a time when sometimes women have started to use up some of their stores. Um, so, and that's really common to have breathlessness. So I think they've probably ruled out the first level of inquiry, if that's like, if you see what I mean. So probably going back and then asking for the next sort mm. of um, level of investigation to sort of get to the bottom. I'm wondering if you have any history of asthma or anything like that, or any allergies. I'm wondering if it's um, something going on there as well. Some women do find as their uterus becomes bigger that they do feel a bit more breathless. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously if it's accompanied by pain or you're worried in any way, then definitely go to your GP. Yeah. Um, or call MAU. Um, yeah, definitely follow it up. Mm, definitely follow it up. And as I say, we've got the Ask the Midwife now line as well, mm. where there, there are midwives who are taking calls from anybody who's got questions, which is a really good service that we're offering at the moment. Women often get palpitations and breathlessness in pregnancy, and although it, it can be normal, um, kind of uh, the body adapting to the pregnancy, the growing pregnancy, it's, it's always important to get it checked out to just make sure that that's what it is. Okay, hopefully that's a bit of an answer for you, Amy. Good luck with the rest of the pregnancy. Mm. Hope, you, hope you get to feel a bit better. Yeah. Andrea's asked, uh, what advice would you give for transitioning from exclusively breastfeeding to combination feeding, expressing breast milk and giving formula, both in bottles? Um, well, you, we would normally sort of talk about sort of trying to, to bring down one and increase the other over a period of time. Um, it, it would be quite good to sort of have a little bit more information about um, so is this baby going to the breast at the moment, or, it, or am I reading this that the, ba the baby's getting bottled with all of this? Um, are you hoping to bring down your supply? So a few questions there to give yeah. you a really good answer. We probably so. really kind of um, adapt, individualise your feeding mm. plan to what your, ever your goals are. So I would really call us, and, yeah. and we'll be able to, to talk you through that and yeah. try and get you as close because. Our role as the infant feeding team is not to get every woman breastfeeding, not to um, you know, um, push people to do anything that they don't want to do. We're here for all families, um, but what we're really here for is to try and get you as close to whatever feeding goals you have. Yeah. And so when you call us, um, we, we always ask you, what do you want to do? What, what's your goal? Or what was your goal before you started having these challenges? And how close can we get you? To where you want it to be and that's definitely our kind of mindset yeah, absolutely um, so i'd call us and we can talk it through with you yeah. individually oh, yeah i think it would be great if we could do that actually because we could um, um get a little bit more information there then um 
and, and, and tailor it to you, to what you're doing. So, uh, Amy's saying she's trying to drink plenty and thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> yeah, good. Anyway. So that's probably a nice thing to say as well, that it's important to drink to thirst. So mm -hmm. make sure you do drink when you're thirsty and sometimes when you're running around looking after your new baby, it can be really difficult to meet your own needs. And just when you're thinking, oh, I better meet my own need for going to the toilet, having something to eat or drink, your little one needs you for something and it gets put back down to the end of the pile and eventually you realise you haven't had a drink for hours. So having someone around to support you and bring you some water or, or have something next to you with water so you can get to it easily with one hand, that sort of thing. But don't be worried about drinking excessively. There's no need to drink lots and lots and lots to produce enough breast milk. Just enough to um, satisfy your own thirst and making sure that you're peeing regularly and it's nice and clear, then you're getting enough um, fluids. And there's no specific thing that you need to eat either. So in some cultures and sometimes um, well-meaning family and friends can often say, well, you shouldn't eat a certain food or uh, you should eat more of a certain food to produce milk, more milk. And as to date, we don't have that evidence. Yeah. There's anything particularly that you can eat or drink that has either a negative or a positive effect on breast milk supply. So um, just eat your normal diet and a wide variety of um, foods because your baby will um, pick up a lot of those strong flavours through your milk and there's some evidence that suggests that babies who've been breastfed, who've been exposed to a wide and flavourful diet are easier to wean on to solid foods because mm. they're a bit more adventurous about um, different flavours because they've had little tidbits of flavours through, through the milk. So, um, and also it might be worth saying that actually um, a mother can neglect her needs quite a bit and, and not eat a very good diet and still make exceptionally good breast milk for her baby. Yeah. So unfortunately babies are a little bit, uh, uh, the, body, the mother's body prioritises the baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you will always make adequate and brilliant milk for your baby even if you live on a diet of you know, chips and on, you know, rice or whatever. And it, um, you'll make brilliant milk for your baby. It might just be at the detriment of your own health, so you may feel more tired, um, you know, and have other sort of mild um, ailments. Um, so you're really eating for your own health and to make sure that you're fit and healthy and nurtured and have your needs met so that you're able to, to meet all these um, needs for your baby um, with as much energy as you can have. So, but don't be worried if you're not you know, that um, you're not eating well um, because your breast milk will be good, whatever you're eating. Yeah, brilliant. Fats, fats seem to be the only thing that change your breast milk. So if you eat a lot of uh, deep fried processed fats, we do see that reflected in mother's milk. But if you're eating a lot of avocados and mangoes and a lot of um, oily fish, so a lot of the good, what we think of as the good fats, um, that is translated into the breast milk, so we see that um, the fats are slightly different between mothers. That's the one, probably the one, the single thing that is different. Yeah. Um, I think in response to Amy talking about how, how tired she's been feeling, Saab has posted that she's here right now and she's having an iron infusion. So that is oh. what happens. So when we have mummies who, you know, people coming in and have got very low iron, then actually they can have um, an iron infusion. Um, so it's you know it's put into their into mm -hmm. their bloodstream and it quite, increases. Quite a lot, this yeah, it? yeah. So that is one way of dealing with it. So please don't don't carry on struggling and you go and get a bit more support because that may be what you need to have to. I'm not saying definitely, but that's one option. Um, Andrea's asked how she can get hold of our number. Oh. Um, so we're on the website, on the OUH website, you can find us on there. I think MVP put a post up after our sessions with our number on as well. And I can give it a shout out right now if you want to. If you, if you just Google Oxford University Hospitals, feeding, infant feeding, um, you'll, you'll be able to click on our webpage and it's got everything on there, all of our names and email and phone number on there as well. Yeah. And lot information that might be helpful as well. If you're sitting there with pen poised, it's 01865 mm -hmm. 572950. That's 572950. But you don't have to remember it, you can get it off the website. Um, Kate has come back. Helen both, not a feeding question, but if I may ask, I'm currently 39 weeks, generally starting to feel rather cramped in the belly or you fall up. Just wanted to ask if it's normal at this mm -hmm. stage to feel quite, let me get the rest of the question up, used to um, the feeling of where we are, I've got the bump. I've got quite used to the feeling of the baby feeling 
heavy lower down, but last few days top of bump feels full and a little hard. Many thanks. Mm, Sophie. <laughs> it's, it sounds like Braxton Hicks, doesn't it, Alex, mm. to me. Mm. Often you'll find that your midwife puts her hand on your on your bump um, to feel exactly that, because the uterus is a muscle and it has a very um, spreading sort of action. And so if we feel that what midwives call the fundus, which is the top of your womb, if we put our hand there, we can actually feel that sort of um, exactly what you described. You described it beautifully, that kind of cramp, sort of hardening feeling. So I would say, personally, just not being able to see you in person, but from what you're saying, I think it sounds like your womb is limbering up and getting having a few practice contractions and sometimes they don't feel painful sometimes they do just feel like that little bit of a squeeze and a little bit firm and then they pass off again um yeah if it's worrying you then get checked out but it does sound very normal to me what do you think Alex? yeah it sounds and also i mean you know as they get bigger the movements are less if they're less sort of fluid they become more stretches so you often find that they're They've got, if, as soon as your baby's head down, that they're actually putting a push up and you're getting the bottom mm -hmm. right in under your rib cage, and you might be feeling a bit of that too. Um, that will make you Sometimes feel quite that can cramped. trigger off a contraction, can't it? And mm -hmm. they sort of push against the walls of the womb, yeah. almost like pushing off the side of the swimming yeah, pool. Exactly. And it can sort of cause the muscle to, to contract a little bit. Mm -hmm. so. Amy's came, come back. Poor Amy, what we didn't know, she might be 23 weeks pregnant. She's also got a five year old and a seven year old. <laughs> so definitely trying you to get a rest. Busy lady. Whenever she can. That's why you're tired. So, uh, and Andrea's come back to say thank you. So, uh, so no questions mm. anymore at the moment. Wow. So, how have we got on our hot facts we're we going to get through today? Mm -hmm. We had a little list. Alex is ticking them off. Yeah. So, we're going to talk about um, women's breasts mm -hmm. because we're all different. So the fact that actually no, no woman has two symmetric breasts, and that's completely normal. Mm -hmm. And that actually the majority of women find that they produce more milk out of one breast than another. And the majority of women will find that that is the right breast that they produce mm -hmm. more in, quite a lot more. Um, so it's interesting, it's regardless of whether they have, you know, what handed they are, whether they're right-handed or left-handed. So we know that there, there is a, a difference, and many women will say if they're pumped, more off mm -hmm. one side than the other, or I look really different one side to the other. There was one milky sister. One's always a bit, you know, less milky than the other one. You, <laughs> you tend to have one workhorse and one drags the feet a bit. <laughs> Kate's come back. Yeah, he's definitely pushing his bottom up. <laughs> <laughs> she said, thanks for the reassurance. It's exactly how it feels, and he's definitely keeps popping his little bottom up. Oh, oh it's a little yeah. him as well then. And oh, so congratulations oh. before we come in. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a weird feeling, and I think when you've had your baby, I think you miss it. Yeah. And my you way and I still often. miss it. It's about the best yeah. thing of being pregnant was having yeah. a baby wiggling around in that. And I think once you've had that sensation as well, sometimes you sit, if you get a sort of bit of a trapped fart or wind or something, and it almost feels like movement, <laughs> because I think once you've experienced that, yeah. you sort of think, ooh, ooh. Yeah. It's yeah, very, it's special, very special time. Very special time. Yeah. So anyway, so that was talking about the, the fact that women's breasts are not the same. No, no breasts are the same. And mm. the other thing to bear in mind is that a baby, that the baby is born with no preconceived ideas of what they're being born to. Yeah. So, so as long as they're not offered anything else. Yeah. So we get, you know, we get told by mothers, mm. oh my nipples are like this, or my breast is like that. Mm. Well, baby doesn't know. Their baby doesn't know what somebody else is like. So mm. actually, as long as that baby only experiences their mother, then they cope. Mm. They cope brilliantly. So if you've got very flat or very inverted nipples, they're fine. They work. Babies just may, the, the pointy erect nipple help is a line, landmark and it helps um, tickle baby's nose and top lip and helps trigger that um, reflex that helps to draw the nipple into a teeth shape. So it may just be um, really important to position your baby properly if your breasts are a little bit softer. Um, but usually touching the nipple or even hand expressing a little bit before you put your little one on can help to make the nipple, the nipple a little bit firmer so your baby gets a little bit more of a cue of when a trigger. Um, but when babies aren't offered anything different, such as a, a bottle teat, they, they just, as Alex says, they imprint on what they're given and they'll work out how to use it. And I have supported mums in the past where, oh, if we climbed out, Alex, 